Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will, and in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Ranu Dillon, uh, who is a doctor uh, with the Harvard Medical School, uh, has worked as an advisor, an Ebola advisor to the President of Guinea, and has worked with the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Welcome to the podcast. Great to be with you. Um, So the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is uh, regarding uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, what have you um, been seeing on the ground? What is the situation like where you are? Yeah, so um, in a kind of funny setup, I am professionally based out of Boston, but I actually practice medicine at a few different hospitals in the Bay Area in California, including some of the areas where we've actually had... um, some coronavirus cases already. Thus far, we haven't had the tsunami that we're expecting um, and based on the epidemiological numbers that we have, maybe even in the next week or two weeks. Um, but we are seeing several cases now in, in the different hospitals that I work at. And one of the big challenges that we also have is that we have a lot of patients coming forward who might be positive for carrying the virus or being infected with the virus. But testing in the U.S. Um, remains a big challenge. We do have the ability to order tests now, but there's a huge lag in terms of actually getting results. So a lot of what we're seeing are patients who could be infected, have symptoms certainly suggestive of possible infection, um, coming from communities where we know there's cases that are happening in the community without any links to previous cases or particular transmission chains that we're aware of. Uh, but the challenge still remains trying to be able to test them and test them quickly so that we can figure out who is truly infected and who is not and get the appropriate measures in place to try to contain transmission as well as treat those patients effectively. Um, what have your thoughts been on the American government's uh, response to it? Do you think that they have responded uh, effectively or, or, or do you think that there are things that could have um, been improved in the initial response? Yeah, I think the, 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 the American response particularly stumbled at the beginning. Um, the challenge with any epidemic, as uh, everyone has talked about in, in the news and, and, and across media, is that epidemics grow very rapidly. It's not just that you get more cases each week. With this virus, what we're having is a doubling of cases every week. So the four cases you may have seen at some point in January – the very next week, that's eight cases. Then the next week, that's 16 cases. So very quickly, you go from something that could be relatively small and circumscribed to being a very massive number of people. And we in the U.S. stumbled in the early stages, particularly around getting uh, systems in place around testing. Um, there is the whole snafu around testing kits and um, the CDC not letting different state level and academic center labs produce their own testing approaches. Um, and then relying on them for the kits, but then there were shortages of reagents. From a news report I saw a couple of hours ago, it looks like San Francisco is about to have a shortage of tests, and San Francisco is another place where there are definitely a number of cases happening. And so we're still actually dealing with that initial stumble around getting testing in place. And the other big challenge of getting behind on testing now and while you're having a doubling of epidemic growth every week is that we really don't have a clear picture of where there's cases, just how many cases there are, For example, in the hospitals that I work, we don't know if the cases are just in one or two neighborhoods or whether we're actually having massive widespread transmission and we're just seeing the sickest folks coming forward. So that big uh, mistake up front has made it very difficult now to get a clear picture of what we're dealing with. We're almost in some sense fighting the epidemic blindly and um, we're still trying to recover from that. The other the other piece of the puzzle that I think we didn't act on uh, aggressively enough and we're now starting to take the right steps, but we're not quite there is actually getting the additional capacity in place at the hospital level to be able to receive a surge of patients that may be coming any day now. Um, What uh, are you expecting in terms of cases in the next couple of weeks, the next uh, couple of months, or is it too early yet to have a a, a fully accurate prediction of how uh, it will progress? Yeah, I I think, you know, uh, it's too early to know with certainty what's going to happen. Um, but based on the trajectory in terms of the, the number of cases that at least where we are confirming by testing and the, and the number that, and the rate at which that's increasing, it looks like we're on a pace that's very similar to what happened in Italy, especially, uh, some of the heavier hit areas in Italy where, you know, based on that same trajectory in the next 
10 to 14 days, if not a little bit sooner, depending on the location, we may be seeing a very large influx of cases. Um, and, you know, in the last couple of days now, New York City has had a, a massive dial up in the number of cases. Some of that may be due to better testing, meaning more people who would have otherwise not been detected or being detected. But it also seems to reflect the fact that we are now starting to move into this realm where we're going to see an influx of many sick people. Um, and of course, Seattle, in some sense, has already been there or is very much on the precipice of, of that situation that Italy has been facing, where you're having large numbers of cases coming in, but maybe not the capacity to be able to receive and take care of all of them. Um, now, you mentioned Italy there. What do you think have been the issues with the initial uh, Italian response uh, to the virus? Yeah, so f- from what I've read and what I've understood, I don't have uh, firsthand um, uh, account of what's happened on the ground there. But from what I've read and what I've understood is that there was a lot of complacency up front. And um, even when there was pushes to have social distancing measures, uh, essentially ways that people are not moving around in public as much, uh, closing non-essential meetings and events, uh, that, that, that advice was not taken as seriously as it needed to have been. And only once things started spiraling out of control did people start realizing how much of a crisis this actually is and how, how much that advice was important to follow up front. And the other, the other factor that seems to be at play in Italy is there may be uh, some reasons why the, the people getting infected there are uh, a larger proportion are getting very sick, meaning requiring ICU level care, requiring uh, intubation and being placed on ventilators. Some of that may have to do with higher rates of smoking as compared to uh, China and South Korea, some of the countries that had initial caseloads. Some of it may have to do with other factors such as higher rates of different comorbidities that we've seen to have uh, association with worse outcomes such as uh, heart disease, kidney disease. Uh, and those types of conditions that set people up to really have, it seems like, a worse illness once infected with this virus. Um, now, in the United Kingdom, uh, the initial response uh, in- included a, a plan to instigate a type of herd immunity in regards to the virus. Now, that seemed quite uh, controversial uh, in the way yeah. it was viewed by other countries. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think, uh, that was, uh, from my, from my lens, a very misguided policy. I think, um, you know, the, the, the approach they're talking about is, uh, let enough people, and I guess in some sense, they were going to tr- see if they could actually control who exactly was getting infected. So basically let enough younger people who seem to generally fare better with infection get infected such that enough people in the population are now immune after having gotten infected that you won't have as uh, enough people to actually have it that the virus keeps propagating down the line to more and more people. Now, herd immunity, uh, the only, the only real way to do that in a way that actually preserves, uh, health and, and, and life from a public health standpoint is when you're vaccinating people, when you're making them immune to the, to, to a virus, um, but not doing so by causing them to get the, the brunt of infection. Um, so, and, and, and Going past that, to to think that we could control just who and how people get infected from from a virus that's spreading so wildly like this, and where we see that a lot of the transmission is actually for people who are not very sick, so it's not like you even know who's really carrying the virus, is really I think um, very misguided, and I think uh, you know a, a really uh, almost a, a degree of hubris that 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 it's um, quite extreme. You know, it looks like now there, there's some there there is a push to now change course. Um, uh, but I think, uh, you, you know, now UK is in the boat that the US to some extent is where there, you're now weeks and days behind where you have to get systems in place, testing in place, uh, get your doctors and your nurses and your health workers prepared at the front lines to receive a number of cases. Um, the other thing I might add that I think was really misguided about that strategy is that though we see worse uh, illness with older patients, patients with comorbidities, even if you somehow got it that the younger patients were the ones, or the younger people were the ones getting infected. We do see a lot of young people get severely ill, end up on ventilators, and have poor outcomes also. So, just because we see it at a higher rate among a certain older subset of the population, does not mean that this is something that's benign for younger people. Um, now, as uh, someone who's obviously um, an expert in this field and uh, is, is, is working with it. I just wondered, how are you uh, personally uh, approaching um, the situation? Yeah, so f- f- from my standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm kind of involved in what's going on from a few different angles. 
Um, a lot of the work I've done in the past has been around uh, responding to epidemics. Uh, for example, uh, Ebola in West Africa. Some of the work I've also done in the past has been around building up health systems. Um, and then uh, the third sort of basket that's relevant to what's going on is that I also practice as a physician. I just happen to be practicing in places where we are actually already having an uptick in cases. So, I mean, in some sense, um, in, in, under all of those hats, sort of bridging the, the experience and, and, and my work in all three realms to, in different ways, uh, help prepare us and respond to this epidemic. So seeing patients in the hospital, taking the lessons and the insights I'm gaining from what it's looking like on that level and that front line, to then also see what are the things we need to be doing from a, a response system standpoint. And what I mean that by that is it's not just a policy and a strategy to respond. You really have to build up the systems of how you're going to get testing done. What are the different ways that you do it so that it's efficient, it's quick. Um, and, and in the same sense, when we talk about building up health systems, much of what we're doing now is having to build up uh, a unique version of our health system that can manage one high volumes of patients coming in, quickly discern who's sick and who's not, quickly discern who needs to be isolated and who doesn't, and then really figure out how do we manage uh, a large number of people who might get very sick and require ICU level care that typically uh, we don't need, we, we are rarely ever giving in the, at the volume that we might face in the coming weeks. Um, I just wondered, uh, you mentioned uh, the building up of um, health system care and the way that the health system has uh, reacted uh, to the pandemic. I, I wonder how do you think this is going to uh, influence health policy going into the future? What um, changes do you think that are being made at the moment that may become uh, permanent? Yeah, I think uh, two areas that I think are going to carry forward um, that 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 I think will be uh, pluses as we go forward dealing with routine disease as well as future epidemics. Um, one is I think there's going to finally be a recognition on the important the importance of testing, and uh, not just testing in big centralized labs, um, not just testing in these big centralized labs and having results come back after you send in samples after a few days, but really having more agile diagnostics. So diagnostics that can be implemented closer to communities, closer to where people live, in doctor's offices, and I think uh, diagnostics that we call point of care, meaning somebody comes with symptoms, you test them, within 15 minutes to an hour, you have a result and you can act on that. Um, I think that's a need that we've seen from uh, not just past epidemics, uh, Ebola epidemics in, in sub-Saharan Africa, but also uh, seeing the range of uh, disease and, and illness in sub-Saharan Africa and India um, and, and the need for health systems to be able to diagnose people better, more quickly, and, and so that action can be taken um, right on the spot. So I think that's going to be a change and a trend that carries forward both for uh, richer countries like the U.S. and I think certainly for uh, uh, lower and middle income countries that are also about to face this epidemic. The second area that I think we're going to see uh, positive changes carry forward is going to be the use of remote health care or telehealth, uh, telemedicine, whichever term you want to use. Basically, an ability to see patients, triage them, even provide a, a relatively higher degree of care uh, without necessarily having the patient having to physically be in front of you. And I think the ability to do that uh, creates all kinds of efficiencies. It allows you to actually manage cases more optimally. Um, it allows you to see and check in with patients more frequently. Um, on the U.S. side, there's been some initiatives around telemedicine, but it really hasn't taken off to the potential that it actually has in part because of regulation um, in part because of the way reimbursements are done. And I think a lot of that is sort of being suspended in the context of responding to this emergency situation in ways that uh, I think will show us that this is actually a very efficient and, and effective way of delivering health care that lets us reach more people and actually in some sense provide better care because we're able to get, get to patients where they are. We're able to check in with them frequently and we're able to also uh, protect them from exposures that would otherwise uh, – uh, take place if they need to constantly be coming to us, waiting in lines, waiting in offices for long periods of time. So those are two areas that I see jump, you know, going forward that that will that will be advantages um, once we're able to uh, push our way through this current crisis. Um, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. It's been um, very interesting speaking to you. Uh, I've just got to um, ask one uh, final question: um, What's one piece of medical knowledge? about this pandemic, about this virus, that you would like the general public to be aware of? I think it's this, um, especially now in the U.S. and in the U.K., it's also there. And I think in many countries where we haven't had testing, 
this virus can look like so many other illnesses. Uh, one of the big challenges uh, that I was facing when I was in the hospital last night is any number of patients come to the hospital with some combination of fever, cough, shortness of breath. And when we have generalized community transmission and we don't know who's infected and who's not, the assumption has to be that anyone coming forward with any of those symptoms or any combination of those symptoms may be infected by this coronavirus. And I think it's for people to take seriously the, the measures that are being pushed right now in terms of trying to avoid public gatherings, trying to stay at home as much as possible. Because if we're moving around, it's inevitable that many, many people are going to have some of these symptoms. Many of them won't be from coronavirus, but some of them would be. And the, the challenge of actually trying to sort out who's infected, who's not would become almost untenable. So I think that's a critical piece to it. It's, it's not that this is something dramatic when you get it and that you clear cut know that, okay, I have some infection that's very serious. It can start in the ways that look like almost any other common cold or common illness you might get, but then progress to something more serious or uh, even just as bad as go to somebody else in whom it will progress to something very severe. So even even though it looks like something that's routine, it can become something severe for you and certainly for for neighbors and family members and loved ones who who don't who want, who may not fare as well with this infection. I think that's a critical piece that people need to understand. Um, in terms of just how silently and deadly this virus can be. Um, well, thank you for coming on uh, the podcast. Uh, I think this is uh, information that a, a, a lot of our, our listeners will find useful. Thank you once again. Great to join you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Don't forget that you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, or YouTube. You can follow us at Debated Podcast on Twitter, like us, Debated Podcast on Facebook. And if you want to email us, either about appearing or making a comment or reaction to the episode you've heard or any other episodes, then email us thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.